I hear it's time to start. I hear speaking. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jill Walsh. I work for Unisys Corporation on the Stealth Program. And the title of our session, as you can see up here, is that compliance doesn't have to be so scary. And we titled our session um, with that name for two main reasons. And the first reason is these guys that are sitting um, directly to my left. So we're going to start with a panel discussion, and our panelists come from different organizations. They have different roles, but they are um, working on compliance issues kind of day in and day out. So we thought it would be educational and, and uh, you know, interesting for you to hear from the, the folks who are really doing this kind of work. Uh, then we're going to follow up with a, uh, with a little uh, talk about our uh, software solution, which is the second reason why we named the session as we did. When we look at compliance regulations, whether they're HIPAA, PCI, CGIS, NERC, FERC, I mean, all of those, when you get to the IT security requirements, there is a software technology that you can use to address an awful lot of those requirements with one product suite. And that's what we want to talk to you about. So it doesn't have to be so overwhelming as it might sound. It doesn't have to be so scary. So that's uh, what we're going to cover in our session today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, bachelor number one uh, is, if you remember, <laughs> dating uh, is uh, Johan Hybenet. Uh, he is the CISO for Hosting.com, and Johan has a tremendous amount of experience in compliance of all types, compliance, um, your regulatory issues. Uh, let's see, Johan is compliance guy by day and um, kind of a hacker by night, so he sort of scares me a little bit. Uh, Bachelor number two is Paul Haugen. He is the CIO from Johnson County, Kansas. Johnson County is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, counties in Kansas, um, very progressive. And so we do a lot of interesting work with Paul and, and his organization as well. And uh, bachelor number three is Joe McCloskey. Joe comes from DuPont Corporation. Joe is the IT security specialist there in the research and development organization uh, for DuPont, uh, which is headquartered in, in Wilmington, Delaware. So we got some East Coast guys, Midwest guys, and, and, uh, and uh, Left Coast guys. So just going to kind of drive into it. Uh, we'll ask questions. You know, if we have time, we'd love to take some questions from you. So, you know, please let's get out of uh, this session as, as much as we can. So kicking off. Um, first question we have for the panelists is, how do you balance meeting your day in, day out work? How do you balance doing your real job with compliance requirements? How do you find the time? How do you find the money? And uh, I was actually going to ask Joe to, to lead off with that. Thanks, Joe. Um, and yeah, that question is, it's difficult to balance, you know, that is the challenge. That's a big challenge, you know, from an internal point of view. Whether an organization is public or private, you know, the goal is to get business done. And that, that's how the users see it. That's how executives see it. Uh, that balance is always changing. Your users, your user knowledge, and technology is constantly changing. So the way you look at that balance and the way you kind of map out your strategy has to evergreen, has to be evergreen, has to be revisited quite a bit. You know, for us, we, need to, we feel like we need to set priorities based on our business requirements. And that's really how you find your resources. Time and money is resources. It's all the same thing. Once you have those priorities and you can sell them to the business, then you can go ahead and, and get those resources to execute. Uh, for us, the goal really is to minimize the impact to users, and we don't want to seem like a barrier to the, to the business, which, um, you know, we're in security. Everybody knows. Uh, as I said in a recent meeting, there's not too many people knocking on my door and saying, can you make my systems run slower? So. Uh, this, this is the challenge. It's, it's, it's difficult because you have to look at each individual scenario, your business priorities, and, and do what's right for you. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you to follow up. Okay. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, probably uh, from a mid-sized business perspective, what I've seen a lot happening is that uh, compliance is becoming mandatory. 
And with it becoming mandatory, that put a lot of mid-sized corporations in kind of in a panic mode because they realize that security is not inexpensive by any means at all. And a lot of mid-sized uh, uh, corporations don't have the staff, or nor do they have the expertise. So being a cloud provider, I want to tout that's maybe a good solution to go in the cloud and partner up with somebody who can provide a lot of the compliance services. I mean, we started looking at compliance today, and I mean, it, it's, it's going to take a full staff to get it done. If you look at a PCI compliance, I mean, you have to have physical controls, logical controls, everything, and, uh, and moving into the cloud and partnering with somebody that knows it can save a lot of cost and uh, hours. Thanks. Our next question for the panelists is, does your organization have a desire to be more secure than just what the compliance checkbox requires? So assuming, yes, you do want to be more secure than just checking off the boxes, how do you manage that? And Paul, I'm going to ask you to... Interesting question. In the government sector, which I, I am, I am family people, that's why I'm here. Um, you know, I, and I think to a certain extent in the private sector, although there's a little more flexibility there, there is an expectation in our, in our organization that we take care of security. Uh, we balance that against the understanding that nobody out there really understands what that means. Okay? Um, so our challenge in this is, yes, we absolutely want to be more secure than what the compliance check boxes state. The challenge is getting people to understand what that means and to get them to become our partners in helping to maintain that secure organization. Um, you know, my goal in Johnson County is to change that perception of security to be the same level of importance as the other things we do. When we hire people, we don't look at color of skin, gender, uh, religious preference or anything like that because we understand that's the right thing to do. I want security to be viewed in the same way in our government sector. I'm not going to hire that person because of this. I'm going to hire that person for this. And I'm not going to plug my USB stick into a port that I haven't been approved to. That's our challenge. We absolutely want to be more secure. And it goes beyond the compliance check mark boxes. You know, I mean, we, 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 all, we all bank on our PCI, P, uh, DSS 3.0. We have CGIS. We have HIPAA. We have NIST. Oh, my God. We've got SCC stuff coming out of our ears. And all of those target specific security requirements. A real security is when we get our people to understand it and incorporate it and live it and breathe it the way the rest of us do. So that's, that's how we're dealing with it in the government sector. Thanks, Paul. And Jerry, do you want to follow up with that? Yeah, yeah. So at DuPont, we have a desire to be as secure as possible. And that's not just, you know, a compliance issue. That's so if you take, take, for example, what we do, we deliver innovation. That's our goal. We're a science company. Um, where's the compliance for that? There is no compliance for that. You know, that's our business. So we have to secure our assets as best we can because that's our bottom line. So we have to look at each, each individual thing. Sometimes compliance may be good enough for certain things. But other things, you know, for IP protection, there, like I said, there is no checkbox. We have to set our own internal standards based on what we need, and we need to apply those controls. Understanding the risk, you know, security is a risk reward game. Everybody here knows that. You know, it's easy to secure a system, unplug it. You know, that's, that's simple. That's, that's, that's ground zero. That's, that's the bottom line. You have to do business. So we have to decide what is important and find out the, the way to apply those controls based on the data that we have. Okay. Um, basically, we go through, we have to identify in our organization based on classification what is the really important stuff. We set those standards and then we need to execute on those standards. Sometimes it will be in line with compliance, you know, either internal compliance or external compliance. A lot of times, especially in a private industry and type of uh, information that we develop and, and what we're delivering uh, to the world is uh, much higher. It's, it's much greater. Um, you think about PCI, you know, there's a lot of breaches that we see on the news all the time about PCI. And we were talking about this the other day, and the, the, they run about the length of a news cycle, and then there's another one. And if you go and you look on the websites, you might see that there's a lot more that are not being reported, right? Um, and not to downplay that, because PCI is important, but everybody deals with that. They go through PCI. 
they have, if there's a data breach, I've had issues personally. I mean, there's probably everybody in this room at some level has or knows somebody that's had charges on their card or something like that happen to them. Um, everybody survives, okay? It's not that it's, that it's just the nature of that attack. If you lose intellectual property, that's a completely different ball game, as I was saying last night. Uh, you can't unring that bell. That's right. You can kind of unring the, the PCI bell, the, you know, uh, my card got, you know, got compromised. But when you lose something that is that's core to your business, you can't really unring that bell. So. Thanks, Joe. Um, our next question, you know, and you had actually touched on this a little bit in your first response. But you know, we hear an awful lot about cloud processing. You know, it's inexpensive. You know, is it the right thing to do? Some organizations just really go forward. Some organizations are hesitant. A lot of organizations are hesitant to move critical processing into the cloud, particularly those kinds of applications which are part and parcel of their compliance requirements. So, Yohan, you are particularly suited um, to talk about you know, your, your thoughts and feelings about using cloud services to achieve compliance, you know, whatever regulation we're, we're talking about. Please. Yeah, that's actually a very good question. I'm very passionate about this, too. Um, if you actually start to look at uh, moving compliance in the cloud, or you have a desire to move a your environment into the cloud, it's not as simple as just moving into the cloud. There are many different type of cloud services, and this would all the IIS, Infra infrastructure as a service, SaaS, PaaS. This is all types of different clouds, and they bring different levels of compliance with them. And this is only the platform is built or an infrastructure structure is built on it, also an environment. And you are, uh, the cloud provider provides you a, a platform, but the environment has to be compliant as well too. So if you go to a cloud provider and say, hey, this, they have HIPAA compliance, in, in, and they only provide that compliance on the infrastructure side, not in your environment. There's a whole new level of compliance there too. That's when you have put in the proper controls like intrusion detection, like log collection, yada, yada, and what you have, all that kind of stuff. So it's important that uh, you actually team up with a provider that, can, that have an expertise in it. And I, if I search cloud providers and I see half of them can even spell HIPAA, they spell HIPAA with two Ps. And, and it's really, I looked at statistics, 30% of people trying to spell HIPAA can't even spell it right. Or it's H-I-P-P-A is what I see all the time. Especially because cloud provider says, oh, well, we are HIPAA compliant, cross your fingers behind your back, kind of thing, right? So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a marriage in a sense. It's a relationship. You need to team with some, somebody that knows what to do on the compliance side. And this is the reason I am so high on the stealth services they can give me encryption in inside the environment. And we are already providing a HIPAA compliant infrastructure, but if we go the extra yard to give our customers, helping them achieve an environment, a, a compliant environment as well too. And that's a lot of, that's a lot of uh, misconception that people don't know. And um, that's why I think this is so, such an important uh, thing to talk about. Thank you. Okay, uh, next question for the panelists. Uh, doing a little Google research, we, it, it turns out that 75% of CISOs, the security guys, now report to the CIOs. And that can create a little bit of a, a conflict of interest in terms of, you know, being secure, but, you know, having your operations move as, as smoothly as they need to move. So, question to the panelists is, um, you know, your security guys and your networking guys or your operation guys, how are you working that out? Are you seeing a conflict, and, and how are you managing that? And um, actually, I was going to say, Paul, could you address that? Yeah, um, I'm not a believer that organizational structure determines the success of an operation, OK? I mean, for me, that's just a home base where people can sit in. What's much more important to me is the relationships that they form and they work with. In the CIO and the CISO relationship, the key is alignment. The key is alignment on what is, what are we doing for the business? And if the information officer and the security officer are joined at the hip, are living and breathing the same requirements, and are moving the same direction, then it doesn't matter if one reports to the other or they both have seats at the seat level, or at, 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 the, at the board level. Um, it's all about the relationships and it's all about working together. Um, in the, in, I, I'm, I'm really happy to see the creation of the information security officer. So is Johan, by the way. Um, 
and I'm, so, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to see it flow more and more into the government sector. I see it a lot at the state level now. I think California has a CISO. Uh, we have a CISO in Kansas, a very sharp guy. Um, and I'm hoping that that continues to roll down into the county level and to other levels because I think that means that the powers that be are showing a recognition of the importance of information security. Um, you know, uh, Joe was just talking about uh, uh, the data breaches that have taken place here that we've all seen in the papers. And I had a really scary experience when I was in Dallas last week when a guy came up and he says, and this was at a technology conference, um, well, you hear about the Home Depot bricks. Yeah, 65 million records stolen. Yeah, now i got to go change my card again. And that was it. And that blasé acceptance of that kind of a security breach scared me a little bit, is that people are becoming inured to those kinds of things instead of, you know, like we deal with and you guys deal with every day, oh my God, there's personally identifying information out there. There's intellectual property that's at risk. So that, that scared me a little bit. And I think having the information security officer and the, and the information officer working together and lining up is going to help us develop some ways to get people back to that point of understanding the importance of these things. So that's, yeah, that, that's just my take on it. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, and Yohan, did you want to follow up on that a little bit? Well, I'd be a little different take on that since I haven't seen so many You knew you would. <laughs> I, I, uh, in my past, I have worked as a CISO, as a contract CISO for hire. I've done a CISO for a lot of larger corporations and smaller corporations. And, uh, and it's correct, about 75% of the time, uh, you're reporting to CIO. And I, I agree 100% if you can align, but a lot of times you cannot align. And uh, it's all about separation of duties. And um, I, I would prefer seeing probably CISO maybe working for something like the legal counsel or something like that. that I think that's a better alignment. Uh, as CIO, he wants to get stuff done and as seamless as easily as possible can get. The CISO wants to get it done right for compliance, and it's very hard to see eye to eye or become aligned with a lot of CIOs. Everybody's not as good CIO as you are, and look at people that thing, but uh, so I, I, I see a lot of times uh, CISOs working for, um, for uh, CFOs, and uh, they, I would say that's not so fun either no. because they're, they're, now you have a conflict of interest in doing the right thing and to do the cheapest thing. That doesn't work either. The legal counsel, I think, is probably the best alignment or working directly under a CEO, uh, which is becoming more and more common these days, actually. I see that more and more that CISO is stepping up directly in alignment from the CEO. So we couldn't be 100% aligned on everything because then it would, be, it would sound too orchestrated. So we had to have a little bit of a difference. Of and Johan, Johan makes a good point. There is a separation of duties issue that we've got, we have to be aware of. Um, and I, I, I appreciate the diversity of thought because that, that gives me stuff to think about too. So. Great, thanks. Uh, so Paul, this one's back to you. And yeah. the question is, what is the most proactive or the techno technologically bold move that you're trying to make right now in your county to align your cybersecurity and your compliance requirements, um, you know. So what? What's uh, well? What's got we're going? we're breaking some new ground in in, in in the government sector back there in, in the heartland, and part of that revolves around changing the way we think about our data centers. Data centers traditionally are looked at as that is our high security vault, huge perimeter security, multiple firewalls, SIM solutions, uh, APT solutions, you name it. And, and we haven't focused on the fact that it's not the data center, it's the data. So we're changing the way we talk about our data centers and the way we're talking about our infrastructure to the point where we're saying it's about the information. It really doesn't matter where the infrastructure is. You've got guys like Johan here setting up these world-class um, uh, hosting centers, you know, which are complete data centers. And, you know, okay, now it's about the information because that's what's important. That's the IP. That's the intellectual capital that, that Joe talked about. That's the financial data that we in the government sector are managing as stewards for the taxpayers. So we're changing that conversation into how do we manage and secure the information. 
That's when we start to look for creative and innovative solutions on managing information, and that's why we're piloting stealth. And I'm, I'm not up here to sell stealth to you guys, okay? I just want to let you know that's, that's the way we're, we're, we're attacking this problem. Uh, in, in, the, in a regional solution like we're at, where we've got many, we've got huge political subdivisions all starting to work together, we want to provide a solution that secures the data. And when Stealth and Unisys came to me and said, we can make that disappear, that's what caught my attention. How can you attack something you can't see? Now you've got the 100,000 foot view on securing your information. And that's what, that's, what, uh, that, that's what we're doing. So I don't know if that's technologically innovative or bold or whatever, but first thing we're doing is we're changing the conversation to focus on managing our information. And then we want to secure the information. So we're putting the data center in a different environment. It's still secure, of course it is. But I'm not going to the commission saying, I need a million dollars to secure my data center. I'm now going saying, I need money so I can secure our information. And that's a different, different perception. Great, thanks very much. And maybe we will have you sell stealth because that's pretty good. Uh, so, the last question uh, from us is, is to Joe. And the question is Joe, what's your top of mind challenge when you're thinking about your intellectual property protection, when you're thinking about your compliance metrics in your environment? What's, what's top of mind to you as the biggest challenge that you need to? So, in a word, it's users. Um, and everybody here is a user just because we're in IT security, don't think for a second you're not a user, right? It, it runs the gamut. And the second thing, and I think it was touched on here without e being explicitly mentioned, is, is you know, I personally believe there needs to be a culture change. If you look at where we are today as to where we were when XP came out, boy, what a difference. What a difference, the ubiquity of the internet, okay? It's everywhere. Who here does not have a smart device that they haven't checked at least five times today? Do we see this trend leveling? No. We see, I see it growing exponentially. I think everybody else does. There would be no need for IPv6 if we didn't have that. You know, we're just going to keep adding more and more devices. I, I guess we don't have the logo in here, but I was noticing the logo of the Internet of Things. And that, that's a real good example. I don't know about the cow. There was a picture of the Internet connected to a cow. I haven't figured that one out. but. <laughs> Yeah, and really the big thing there, again, is the users and the culture of that and, and how we need to drive that. You know, there, and I think in a tech community, there's a, there's, a, there's a common theme I hear a lot, especially the deeper you get technically, is that, well, the users really don't know what they're doing. Yeah. The users really do know what they're doing. They just don't care about what we care about the same way. I, it, when smartphones first came out and you had somebody who really didn't know, what did you do? You handed it to a teenager. And they figured it out for you, know, and no problem. They didn't have any training, okay? Consumerization breeds that's this technical savvy. We know this. It's, it's obvious. And consumerization is being pushed out into industry, and it's being pushed out into the workplace. You know, we have BYOD, BYOC, and we're pushing things into the cloud, which previously were traditionally consumer-based spaces. So we have this co-mingling here of this, and we have to find a way to, let's see, now you gave me the sign on. That's okay, Larry. <laughs> I appreciate that. We have to find a way to keep in step with that. Okay. Um, we we want to make it, and it kind of goes back to not being a barrier. We want to try to implement security so the users don't even see it. Now, part of that is they're going to see it. That's that's the, the culture change. I kind of liken it to, you know, seatbelts. How many people you know, don't wear seatbelts nowadays. 30 years ago, how many people didn't wear seatbelts? You know, a lot more. And why? Because it was just stupid. Why now? Because it's just stupid not to wear it. We almost need that culture shift, that paradigm shift to say, this is the way it is now. And there has to, you know, we have to drive that. And part of that is, uh, you know, we have to make sure that we're doing the right things too. You know, and I'd say, well, I know what I'm doing because I'm a technical guy, so I can do this. I can do it this way, but my users have to do it that way. They're smart enough to know that, and and it, it breeds it breeds bad practice and bad, bad example. You have to be careful, though. There's there's a balance again. So if you go crazy with saying, you know, 
not to pick on Paul, but you know, plugging in a USB port, but no attachments. If you try to lock down too much, because these users are so tech savvy, they will find a way around it. I'm sure everybody here has seen that. They will go what I call underground. And then what's work so it's the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. Right? Users today are the are the new perimeter. We can talk about securing data centers and putting up all this infrastructure. You send out a phishing email, and there's all your penetration right there. So we're, we're locking the front door and opening up the windows. We're not closing them all the way. So to me, that's top of mind. But I'm not passionate about that. <laughs> How do you really feel about that? So, Brett Gay, thanks very much. Um, we actually have time. I'd like to you know, field a couple questions from the audience. If you have Questions about how any of our panelists, you know, compliance related or cybersecurity related. I have a question. Please. I'm just asking, um, uh, in the situation with uh, my agency, we're Sacramento County Sheriff and we have uh, Sacramento County IT. What, uh, we used to have an ISO at the county IT level, and they want to send the responsibilities to the sheriff to mirror what FBI, DOJ, and counties, you know, that access threats, law enforcement. Specifically, the personnel that considers themselves control posts of the region that provide law enforcement data. Do you think that the ISO responsibility should be at the county level or at the sheriff level? And why? I am living that nightmare right now in Johnson County. Okay, yes. Um, and that is, that is one of the driving factors behind our research into stealth as a possible solution for us. Um, I'm coming at that from the corner of, as I said earlier, information management. CGIS is all about information management. It's not about fiber. It's not about switches and routers. It's about information. Being able to provide a solution that continues to give our sheriff's department and our court system uh, complete control over their information while being able to manage a single flat network accomplishes a couple things. One, it keeps us compliant. And two, it allows us to lower our costs. We spend an extra $300,000 a year maintaining two separate networks, and there's no reason for that. That's not value to the taxpayer. Um, there is a belief, as many of you have had to address and had to deal with, is that CGIS is, can be interpreted two ways, you know, separate networks or separate information. Some people still believe in a separate network. We don't believe that, so that's how we are coming at this. I, I have no interest at all in being the single point of authority over law enforcement information. I have none, okay? That is, a, that is a, 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 an environment unto itself. We already have some really good people that can manage that. Now if we can bring a solution to the table that continues to allow them to manage it while still saving money, that's the win that I'm looking for. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else? Nice chance. Okay. Then um, what I'd like to do is switch over to um, John Stubbs, who's actually going to tell you what stealth is. You know, I think you heard a couple of teaser kind of comments about why some of our clients um, are using Stealth. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So John? Thanks, Jill. I think I introduced myself as bachelor number four. Oh, I should have said that, bachelor number four. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so first of all, thank you for, for, whoa, um, for attending the session. There's a lot of great information that you can get from a variety of different kinds of businesses, including uh, city and county government. So we felt that that was a great opportunity for you to hear how somebody is um, and, and is very empathetic to the same kinds of problems that you have, as well as from a mid-size hosting partner. And obviously DuPont represents uh, a very, very large client. So with that, I just kind of wanted to walk you through a little bit about this innovative, disruptive kind of technology called stealth. We, and and we, we all understand all of these different acronyms and, and things about the different compliance requirements. And while they can seem daunting, and we talked about some of the issues that each of us have to face, both personally and professionally, I think if we took a higher level view and understood some of the significant words that every one of these uh, compliance requirements talk about, in their solution and what these folks need to do and what you need to do, I think we'll get a better understanding of how we approach it from a Unisys and stealth perspective. 
Some of this may be, um, well, very common sense. But as I said, if we look at the seven basic security principles within security today, every one of these that are above here, so confidentiality, integrity, availability, we call those the pervasive security principles, authorization, authentication, non-repudiation, and auditability, every one of those is actually listed in all of the security components of each of those um, compliance regs that you mentioned. So I was punished um, recently, well, probably eight or 10 years ago when HIPAA first came out. I'm not sure what I did to deserve the, the, um, the, uh, the level of understanding that I needed to go in the deep dive into HIPAA, but that was a very excruciating experience for me. So if any of you have addressed and, and understand HIPAA requirements, it's a very daunting task. And it was hundreds and hundreds of hours that I personally had to do just to understand the security rule. So, and, and I was able to apply that understanding to what came out next, which was GLBA, Gramley's Briley, and then Sarbanes Oxley, and then PCI. So I think if you understand those seven security, basic security principles, and understand how the technology, both new and old, that exists today, addresses each one of these, then you can kind of carve out a kind of a solution path for your individual requirements. So I also want to address that from a security perspective, we're, we, we are not talking, or excuse me, from a privacy perspective, we're not talking about oral or written. We're really just talking about electronic security. And in the case of stealth, we're talking about data in motion not data at rest. So there are those kinds of things. And of course, all great compliance um, needs start and end with training at the individual level because they need to understand what they can and cannot do. And certainly, just to make it really simple, you can't just leave on your voicemail or write down a piece of paper your social security number or your Home Depot credit card, although, oh yeah, that's been done already. Um, so that everybody understands what that number is and understands that that's personal information to you. I kind of like what Joe said about protecting the intellectual property of DuPont. And DuPont is an innovation company. And DuPont depends on the, the, um, the protection of that, of that IP. Well, our individual credit card numbers, our individual health, uh, health information, that's our IP as well. That's, specific to us, and that's our intellectual property. So again, uh, we're going to focus on the electronic pieces. Anybody else hear that music? Or is yeah, it yeah. Okay. I'm not going crazy, Joe. So stealth represents a technology, and Paul's, Paul said it about you cannot hack what you cannot see. And so if you basic understand that that information that you don't want the wrong people to get a hold of, if we can demonstrate that we can hide it from people that shouldn't have access to it, then that addresses a couple of those security principles, right? It addresses the confidentiality of that information. Now, a good security technology also has to make sure that it's available to the right people. So when the people need it, the right people need it at the right time, that's also part of a security rule and a compliance requirement. We do that by making sure that the right people have access to the information and that the wrong people, not only do they not have access to it, but those hackers can't even see it, right? So if you can't see it, how are you gonna compromise it? So with stealth, what we do is we have a basic premise. And the premise is, is the way that the Johans, Pauls, the Joes used to address security and their own organizations is that they built this really strong perimeter around all of their assets. Well, I think we would understand that today that really doesn't work. And we know that doesn't work because almost every day there's a breach of some, some sort or there is a, a, a major security flaw in the systems that we are traditionally using today. So the reality is, is that that fortress really isn't that solid core wall that we once thought it was, that it has lots of uh, holes in it. Now we have in this picture, this diagram, an understanding that we need to protect assets differently 
certain assets need to pre need to be protected much more than other assets. Now, that's not the best that's not the best way to think of it, but it is the appropriate way to think of it because we know that intellectual property, PHI, PII, financial information, credit card information is much more important than many other things that are that our uh, systems are protecting on a day in and day out basis. So the reality and what we're suggesting is we need to understand those crown jewels. We need to identify the DuPont's intellectual property. Hosting.com's clients where they're addressing, they have, their clients have HIPAA information or PCI information. And in the Johnson County, they have PCI information and other things that are critically important to their survival and the expectation of their constituents, of their citizens. So what we are proposing, and we, we now have some uh, gardener um, backup, so to speak, is that we need to focus on those business and mission critical assets. What are those? You need to identify those. In some of our clients, they actually said that understanding their business and mission critical assets is in fact a business and critical asset. So just understanding what they are and where they are is itself very important. So we want to identify the mission or, or business critical assets, who should and what should have access to those. We want to build a compartmentalized software security model based on the need to know, right? Again, that's the confidentiality and the availability that we talked about that are so important in all of the regs. Protect those crown jewels and data in motion. And what we're suggesting is you start from the inside and work your way to the outside so that those users that need to gain access appropriately can gain access. So with the Unisys stuff, and, and I'll let you read all this, but the point of is in, in the solution of you can't hack what you can't see, what a hacker sees, this is a typical environment, you got the, the World Wide Web, you've got servers, firewalls, IDS, IPS, all the other security technologies that are out there, and also users. When we put those IP addresses on stealth, they actually disappear to what the hacker can see. Now, some of you are like, I understand that, and some of you want to challenge us, and we welcome those that want to challenge us, because in each and every one of those, I, I know two of the three right away wanted to challenge the premise. But if you ask those individuals offline, um, they will tell you that stealth does exactly what's advertised, that it causes the intellectual property um, to disappear from those people that shouldn't have access to it. So the idea being from an outside-in perspective, we're protecting the crown jewels of each of these organizations. So what is stealth? <clears throat> it's, it's, it's encryption, moving information from point A to point B. Okay, so you can all think about which one of those seven security principles um, this addresses. So obviously encryption in motion addresses the integrity of the information as well as the access to that information. Okay, so that's the first thing. We leverage existing technology as well. So this is a software-based solution that does not require folks, the IT folks, to change applications or infrastructure. You overlay the software technology onto your existing network and we ask you to interface with your identity management and or your Active Directory. So by leveraging your existing technology that's already there, that you already have a significant investment in, and by defining like communities of interest. So those folks that are, are always traveling, or the IT organization, or the scientists, or an end user, a particular end user in hosting.com, for instance, by saying that these folks belong into a community of interest, a unique, separate community of interest, then you're segmenting, you're doing what the uh, compliance folks want you to do, which is sometimes air gapping your network. We're doing that through software by compartmentalizing. So in my example up here in these communities of interest, even though they're on a flat network, those that are in blue, we'll call them <coughs> the blue community of interest, and those in the red community of interest, even though they are next to each other, they're touching, they're on the same network, blue cannot see red, red cannot see blue. Right? It seems like a very simple concept. And we've spent lots of dollars on putting VLANs in and firewalls and creating tiers and tiers and tiers of architecture. 
at a great expense as we get closer to those crown jewels, we're saying we can minimize some of that. Now, by the way, I'm not here saying stealth is the end all be all of all security technologies. I can't address um, good people gone bad, social engineering. I, I cannot predict, and stealth cannot predict, what the user has in mind when he accesses appropriately some of the information. But what we can do is by offering another layer of security that isn't the same kind of security that folks are using today, we, we can provide incremental levels of security. So I'm not here to talk about you have to remove all your firewalls, you have to remove all your IDS, IPS. This is something that's in conjunction to what you already have. Now what I believe is the secret sauce for Unisys and why we are different is because instead of solving a problem high in the protocol stack, and I, if some of you don't understand the protocol stack, we've kind of listed it up there, but most security technologies, most technologies in fact, work on layers four through seven. So seven would be the application layer, and we all understand what that means, right? When you sign in to an application, an Oracle ERP or whatever it is, you're putting in your username and password. So we address the security problem below layer three, which means by the time it gets to the NIC card on your PC, on your laptop, in the server, in the SAN, we say it's a good packet or a bad packet. So we're not even asking the application to verify that you are who you say you are. We're doing it ahead of time. And that's because of how we use, the, as I said, the existing technology by leveraging the Active Directory. We just have a completely different approach. And our approach is to solve this big problem very low in a protocol stack. And that's why these folks here um, are leveraging the technology of stealth inside of their own enterprises. Because when we do this at layer three, below layer three, we are solving that problem. Now, how do we go invisible? So if somebody has the IP address, and let's pretend that I am the crown jewel, I am the, I am the server that's, that's hosting all of this really cool DuPont, for instance, intellectual property. I have an IP address. I put stealth in my machine, so, and, and then I say that the scientists or that the board can get to my machine. So therefore, we all belong to the same community of interest. Somebody sends me an IP request, and I go, yep, it's my IP address, but it doesn't have stealth. It doesn't belong to the same community of interest. So instead of responding by saying, hey, you've got my IP address, but you don't have stealth, and you don't belong to my community of interest, instead of responding that way, I ignore the request. And by ignoring the request, I actually, it, it never really existed. The technical term is, it, I let it go right on by, goes in a bit bucket and gets destroyed. No negative response comes back. So that if you're pinging me as a hacker, Johan, um, you're gonna continue to get on my IP address. If you, don't, if you don't have stealth belong to my community of interest and you're pinging me, that little cursor on your screen is gonna keep blinking. No response. It's as if the IP address doesn't exist or it's turned off. And it's because of the way that we're addressing this and do this very low in the protocol stack is why we say you can't hack what you can't see. Now, I'm kind of getting the, uh, the, the cut sign. So um, I, I think what I want to do is just open it up for one or two questions. And of course, we'll be here uh, out in our booth. And bachelor vet number one um, um, can tell you where that is. Sure. Since I just know directionally where it is. Yeah, it's, it's actually booth number uh, 19, I think. And I just want to tell you one more thing. Uh, but, we, but we will stay and, and answer any questions that you have. But if you, if you need to uh, move on, because I know it's us and then lunch, you know. Um, as you walk out, please grab one of the USB drives if you're interested. It has uh, this presentation. It has some other information about Stealth. It has some collateral. Um, it has a little information about our speakers. So, and, and it's a nice USB. It's, well, it's a nice yeah, I was going to say, you're asking a security professional to take it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all standing clean. I'm in this network. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, but we do have some. If if, uh, if we can add a couple questions, you want, we can you know, shoot you an email or just shoot us your email. But we certainly understand that. Well, I haven't touched up. Go ahead. You, you have a question. You have a question. Oh, okay. Any questions? Yes, sir. Is there anything in this scheme to prevent someone with a rogue device from just listening in on the network? Traffic's already going back. So we're encrypting, right? So information from point A to point B. So the listening, unless they can unencrypt at the other end, listening isn't going to really help them. Now, we also have incremental to this technology. We have what we call bit splitting on, on one of our versions of the, of the technology. And we actually, if you think about, let's say you and I are having a conversation and Johan's trying to listen in, we actually shred the bits as well. So that way you could grab a part of it but then you would have to unencrypt and unshred uh, at the same time, and it hasn't been proven to be done yet. Sorry, you Oh, I tried. I know you tried. <laughs> I looked at it. Any other questions? Thank you for that. Well, we want to thank you for attending. Hopefully, you found this valuable. And uh, I think I'm standing between letting them go to lunch. I think that is it.